Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting in a lot of ways. And I was thinking about uh, th that um, there is a report of a study a um, few, few years ago telling that most Americans don't have $400 for emergency uh, expenses. And I was thinking how the lack of social protection is also something that makes credit as a complement of lower wages. So people are not paid uh, enough for their daily expenses, so they have to recur to, to credit uh, as a form of social protection, in a way, I was, I was thinking about it. Uh, so how this, uh, I don't know, how do you think this connects with the, the recent debt crisis in the U.S. and how this affects uh, um, how so the lack of social protection in the U.S. affects uh, the workers there. Well, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, really interesting and also the commenter's presentation. I just wanted to make a, a small comment on this regulation theory um, comment you made. But I think it's uh, really complementary your work with what the regulation school is doing, especially because nowadays I think they are moving to this meso space. Like for example, housing could be a, a space of uh, regulation. And re regarding to this, or also the gradual shift and how from one era to the other, or from one mode of development, you uh, inevitably continue with some things from the previous um, Say, um, moment of or mode of development, but I, w I wanted to ask you if your micro analysis could be used for nowadays to understand nowadays shift from let's say one mode of accu accumulation which is financialized to the future which we don't know, and if this could be seen from a French regulation approach in the sense that you are seeing actors reacting to a bigger structure, in a sense, of how they organize to, in this case, uh, fight the people who are collecting the, the debt. So maybe, I don't know, if uh, I wanted to hear your opinion on this sense, because maybe by studying nowadays reactions to, for example, the housing problem in uh, around the world, we can have some clue on how the people are organizing to face this macro abstract uh, model, and this can give us some hint on how to conceptualize a bigger picture from the bottom up, I think, from your um, perspective, which is really stimulating, I would say. Hi, my name is Lorena. <coughs> I am from El Salvador. Thank you so much for, for this presentation. It's very, it was very interesting, and um, it made me think a lot about the work of two feminist economists from Argentina uh, that wrote a book about a feminist perspective on debt. Because I think that the work that you've done, it's not only important in a historical way, uh, political, sociological, but also it's important because it's, in the words of these authors, is a way of getting debt out of the closet, which means that we're not only talking about debt from a macro and very abstract perspective, but we're also uh, analyzing how it plays an important role in the everyday life and how it's embodied and embedded in very particular contexts. So I just wanted to, to, to say that I think um, feminist economics has a lot to say on, on how uh, debt from this very embodied and embedded and embodied uh, perspective has an important role in different people, re re depending on their gender, their, their, their race. And um, also, I think it's very interesting, connecting with Caroline's um, comment, how <coughs> debt has this ambivalent role. On the one hand, it's a mechanism that enables people in the US, but also in global south countries, to, to access those services that the state is not able to provide. But on the other hand, it also limits and constrains our, our possibilities in the future. It forces women, for example, to stay in violent relationships. It, um, it forces people to, to 
to get very precarious jobs. So, but this is, this is very different from the 19th century or, you know, the, 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 the time period that you were talking about. So I would like to know how this historical analysis that you presented, how can we extrapolate this to present time and to neoliberalism um, and financialization and, and think about how debt is now playing a role in our lives depending on different particularities and contexts. Thank you. Okay, fine. Uh, if, uh, last one. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my name is Ted. I'm from Canada. Um, uh, I really like your presentation because it gave some, you know, uh, cultural, sociological, and historical life to some of the topics that historians, or, or sorry, economists deal with in a bit more of an obtuse way. And so my question is actually to reframe this in a bit of an obtuse way. But um, just, you know, you know, currently we talk about endogenous money, uh, shadow banking and all that. And we know that that's evolved from a previous system. Um, and so if you were to translate these institutions that you've studied uh, into maybe more theoretical economic terms, would you say that they are just, um, you know, lending on a fractional reserve basis? Um, uh, or can they actually create new credit? Um, if you could maybe translate that into a bit more economic terms, uh, that would mm -hmm. help, I think, just for us to understand how they existed at that time. Thanks. Okay. If I may add just something which is not a question. Uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, I mean, at that time they were going into debt because also they don't have social protection. And I don't know. Uh, uh, Two years ago, I think, Lena Lavinas wrote an article about what happens in Brazil while developing uh, social protection, and in particular, Bolsa Familia. And, and she explains that it has been used as a collateral mm -hmm. for those people to go into debt. So uh, yeah, in both yeah, cases, yeah. You, you assetize, in a way, the... Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so thanks for your questions. This is, this, this is a really interesting, actually, but... So like the more general answer to all that is that uh, part of the way we're fascinated always about the US case right, is because it's always like this sort of matrix of where does uh, capitalism lead. Like, so yeah, there is stuff happening in the US that then will sort of trickle to other countries. So this is why also I'm interested in the US is because you see stuff like the, the things that I'm describing are, uh, have been happening in France in the 1950s and 60s in a much more similar way, and they're happening in a various uh, type of like uh, 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 various uh, countries uh, throughout the world uh, at the very moment. Like uh, throughout my PhD, I've met people who worked on, on Chile, on, uh, on Brazil, actually a lot on Argentina as well, and they were all saying like, oh yeah, but the same thing is happening in my, in my country. So I'm, I'm kind of used to these parallels. Like yeah, like this is the and it's always the same sort of debates that. But come on, except that the, the Americans have also this sort of colonial thing that usually developing countries with the respect to French finance have some sort of connection to US firms. But rather than what I'm looking at, it was very much a national story. So there's always, there's that. Uh, um, and then regarding the more precise question. So for your first question, it was, uh, I mean, it's very true that, um, that uh, low wages were actually the first reason why they, they borrowed, right? And the, the main problem we have with that, with that as historians is that we don't have the opinion of these borrowers, right? They were never heard, they had never, no voice, they had no platform. So throughout my entire archives, I found one thing, and it's really interesting when, when it comes to you, your question. So there was a letter that was sent by a trade union of uh, washerwomen in a city called Macon, Georgia. So it's uh, in reference to Macon in France. Uh, and, uh, and so the, these, this group of, of women who were in the same trade, and it was really a trade union, they sent a letter to the mayor of their city saying that they wanted protection from the loan sharks, right? And then they said, because basically what they said was that white people didn't pay them enough. And because they, the families that they were washing the clothes for didn't pay them enough, they had to go to the, to the companies. And so black on white, you see the, these, these ladies saying basically that uh, the lenders are not responsible for their uh, for their situation, it's the, the white families that don't give enough money, you know? But it was much easier for the white families to sort of fight for, you know, better credit and whatever than just to pay the, the, the domestic workers more money. So here you really see 
this sort of like civil society popping, but it's like a small article in a small paper. Like it is like one of those things where you're like, oh, this was probably it, but I have only this one occurrence. So do I make a big deal out of it or do I just treat it as an isolated case? I have the intuition that it was actually a much larger thing, but since we have no traces of that, we have to, to do with what we can, but it goes directly in the sense that you were pointing at, you know, like uh, it's a question of wages and it's a question of social protection. And, uh, and it's not really a question of, of uh, morality or whatever. And um, regarding the, um, the second question, actually it, it, it's very complicated to try to connect, you know, macro stuff with micro stuff when it comes to, uh, um, when it comes to, to all these issues of regulation and, uh, and political evolution. Um, I am not the best to sort of do that because I really am a, I'm an empiricist at heart and I, I try to draw like large conclusions in the end and sort of wrap it up, but I'm not into this sort of articulation stuff. But I, there was a, there's, a, there's someone, a colleague of mine who's called uh, Quentin Ravelli that you might have heard of, who really tries to do that and he actually made a, he, you know him, but like, no? He's a sociologist and he did his work on the mortgage crisis in Spain. And he did both a book and a documentary that is called Bricks. And uh, he basically studies uh, social movements of uh, tenants or landowners who are expropriated uh, because of the mortgage crisis and how they try to understand how the system was working, the macro system, financial system, and how you could intercept this system. So they're really trying to uh, break the liquidity of financial assets, which I think is, is quite interesting, right? You see these social movements that are just emerging. It's like, okay, so the system works like this. How are, gonna, how are we gonna mess with the system, right? So they're trying to take away sort of, of the liquidity of financial assets just to protect their own interests. So I would advise just to, I think it was an interesting thing. He had a couple of papers, mostly in French, on, the, on the, how, to, how to break uh, financial circuits. And I think this is a good thing to keep in mind for social movements that are concerned with finance. Like, uh, it's a little bit conservative to sort of go against the liquidity of stuff, but this is one of the things they can do. Um, uh, so thanks for the comment about like uh, uh, feminist economists. I think it, it, it rings many bells, um, uh, especially because there's a recent trend now uh, in my field, in particular, the history of debt to sort of like show that it was, uh, it concerned way more people and there were different initiatives and uh, in the same series that I will publish my book in, there was a, a book by an American scholar called Shanette Garrett Scott, I can also write it down, and she did a whole book on uh, African American women initiatives, especially in the same time that I'm working on and saying like this is, there's a forgotten history of uh, diverse financial institutions. You know, we have this idea that it was uh, uh, black people were mostly excluded from, from, from finance until the, the 1980s and 90s, and it's actually not true. There's a lot of stuff happening. And, um, and, and it's especially interesting from an intersectional point of view, because in my case, for instance, we always have this idea that the, the sort of, the, that dominations kind of accumulate. So if you're like, a woman is bad, but if you're a minority, it's bad. And if you're a woman from minority, it's really, really bad, right? And in that case, it's, it's, it's quite the opposite. Like African-American women were may, way more included in that system than their husbands, for instance, or the men, because they faced, for other reasons, like in my case, it's because they faced less competition than uh, black men with uh, white workers, right, at the time. So you need to have a... Uh, that's where intersectionality is actually interesting because it brings out new results that you wouldn't have if you cl if you cross you know class, race, and gender. You come out with stuff that is not necessarily intuitive in the first hand, and um, and uh, and I think it's a nice way to to sort of show how uh, these debt, more structural like uh, uh, inequality issues, intersect with more identity related stuff, and uh, and it it brings out new result actually, which I think is really interesting and and uh, that we just can't really dismiss uh, in this sense. And, uh, and of course the question is how you articulate this sort of more personal aspect, like uh, how you talk about the lives of people and still connect it to larger things. And uh, this as a historian is always very difficult, right? You, you this, like the story I gave of this African-American washerwoman, like it's, it's, you can only give glimpses of that and then you have to jump to conclusions, but but of course, it gives more body and more, more flesh to the story. 
but at the same time, it's, it remains a very simple example, and there's no way for me to tell how many people were in the same situation and so on. So this, in, in terms of social sciences, we have to, when you do qualitative stuff in that sense, you have to, to work with, with what you have. Um, and finally, the, I'm not sure I understood the, how can I put it in more economic terms. Uh, you mean in terms of economic theory, really? Um, so, like what? How, yeah, like how can I compare with credit created? Ah, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things I, I have two, two, two short answers to that. The, the first one is that it was created um, uh, through these legal devices. That's one of the answers I would say. I would like, there was actually people who had to print out slips of paper and understand the law. That's the whole thing of legal coding, right? Uh, I don't know if that ended like in sociology, this is how we. We, we think about things like, you know, like who actually created the money in that sense. Uh, yeah, wait, or, so, yeah, yeah. Or, or even through the like balance sheets, but it, it's okay. No, 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 but it's, I think it's an interesting stuff. I, I, um, I would have one answer when it comes to shadow banking that, uh, that you talked about. Um, there's a lot of work on shadow banking at the moment, trying to understand typically how you can regulate something that is so elusive, right? And this is where I think it's one of the most interesting, some of the most interesting sociological work on regulation has been done on shadow banking because uh, these people look really precisely on, at how some experts try to regulate the shadow banking sector and, uh, and how difficult it is, you know, and they're always one step behind. And so to understand really how the system works, you have to really get into the detail of how, how certain regulators try to interact with certain firms and. Like, I don't know, it gets really messy because, uh, because you have actually not such a big amount of actors. And, uh, and there's a really good paper that I quote in, the, um, in my bibliography by Matthias Thiemann, who's at Sciences Po. And has, he has, he's between an economist and a, and a sociologist. He's worked a lot on the regulation of the, of the shadow banking sector. He has a book coming out. But, and it, I really use the same theoretical background. So in that sense, it connects. Like this idea of how do you produce compliance and how do these political movements uh, have effects on larger structures? Uh, I really build on his framework, so I would, I would, uh, I would advise you 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 get uh, I mean you get acquainted with his work. I'm just going to provide the reference, but uh, and the uh, the author I was referring to before is called Shane Garrett Scott. And you, you can look at her book on the role of African-American women in, in the history of finance. It, it was quite kind of a groundbreaking uh, uh, thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there is any more question. We, I think that's it. Yeah, Thank okay. you very much. Paul. Thank you.